Is the Bible reliable? It claims to be inspired. It claims to be inspired in the Old Testament and in the New. We already gave um, seven pieces of evidence of what biblical archaeology has uh, given to uh, those who um, profess faith in the uh, inerrancy of the biblical text. Uh, in the Old Testament. And what this is, is a quick look at some of the other miscellaneous evidence that biblical archaeology has given to the biblical stories in the New Testament. This course didn't cover that, but you are going to uh, be heading into uh, New Testament stories in your next course. Um, and therefore, uh, here is some quick evidence of the proofs that um, Biblical archaeology has brought to the reliability of the New Testament text as well. Three in particular in this quick look. Uh, a Gentile inscription, 30 pieces of silver, and a man named Sergius Paulus. The Gentile inscription was found in 1871, and it relates directly to one of the New Testament stories as recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 21. In particular there, uh, the man named Paul, the Apostle Paul, has returned from one of his trips, and he is um, caught by a mob in the uh, temple area of the Jerusalem temple, and he is accused of having brought a Gentile, that is a non-Jew, into the uh, area of the, the temple that is forbidden to, uh, to Gentiles, to non-Jews. Uh, what has been found in archaeology is the uh, one of the uh, several, evidently, uh, 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 inscriptions that were there at a wall, a parapet, um, that kind of divided the temple area so that people would not make that kind of mistake of taking or going into the wrong area of the court of courtyards of the temple that were forbidden. There were specific areas. So there was an area for the everybody, the Gentiles included, then just Hebrew people, just uh, children of Israel, and then just uh, men, and then of course the Holy of Holies, just one man, the uh, high priest, once a year. So there were all kinds of restrictions with regard to who could go where in the temple. You can't just casually walk in. And it was serious. The translation of this inscription that has been found, actually more than one, but this is an example, reads like this. No man of another nation to enter within the fence and enclosure round the temple. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death ensues. That's a translation of the Greek uh, words that you saw on the tablet uh, just before you that's been found as evidence of the very strict laws. Um, now, the point is that Apostle Paul would have never violated it. He knew these. He had spent years in college in Jerusalem, had been at the temple often. He would have no reason, would never have, and thus he is innocent, but the mob is going to kill him because he's accused falsely of having taken a Gentile into the wrong courtyard. So just a little slice of evidence uh, that comes from archaeology of the um, um, of the narrative of the story that's narrated in Acts chapter 21. Here is Acts chapter 21, a few verses of it. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him, being Paul in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. 
Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gate was shut, and as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in uh, an uproar. Uh, so uh, Paul's life will be saved from a vicious Jewish mob. Um, the Roman commander that is nearby will save Paul's life. Uh, because he is falsely accused of bringing a Greek, a Gentile, into the courtyard uh, that is uh, forbidden to them by that sign. Um, here is another fragment of that same inscription. Again, it's in Greek. The uh, inscription would have been actually in more than one language, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, so that anybody could read it and know uh, if you are not supposed to go past this temple, if you're a Gentile, you're not supposed to go back past this uh, area of the temple, this wall, this gate, and the temple. So, uh, bits and pieces of evidence of the biblical narrative. Um, here are some uh, uh, um, findings as well. Um, the uh, price of betraying uh, Jesus to the Sanhedrin is recorded by Matthew, uh, who was in his previous life, before he became an apostle of Jesus, he was a, a tax collector, so somebody like an accountant, um, uh, IRS official, and uh, coinage, of course, being the only way in which they dealt with currency payments, etc. They didn't have banknotes, so to speak. Uh, and 30 pieces of silver are, is listed by Matthew as being the price of betrayal, what the, uh, what the uh, uh, high priest and the Sanhedrin paid for Judas to betray Jesus. And those are the same coins that then he turned around as he tried to give them back and threw on the ground as recorded also when he changed his mind about uh, that particular act of betrayal. Uh, in, in, in a certain way. Well, here are evidence from archaeology of the shekel. Uh, still today, Israel's currency is called the shekel. These are shekels that were found in Tyre. This is a, uh, a detail of uh, the shekel. Uh, again, in ancient first century times, there were Roman coins, there were Greek coins, and then there were uh, coins that only, um, the only coins that the um, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and in the temple were used, which were um, minted coins that had Jewish symbols on them. Uh, the shekel was a Jewish coin, while the tetradrachma was a Greek one and the denarius was a Roman, and all of those have been found in the, but uh, when the Bible mentions a type of coin, like for example when Jesus pays a tax, you'll find another story about a coin that Jesus used, what found in the mouth of a fish, uh, it is uh, uh, exact even in its details. Another archaeological evidence of the biblical narrative. One other, it is the mention of a, a famous, should have been, a biblical narrative calls him a governor, which is a like saying one of the vice presidents of the Roman Empire. Uh, governors were second only to the emperor. There was more than one of them, but there were many of them throughout the empire. But Sergius Paulus, a very important uh, uh, reference to a, a governor. And it's his story, his story of his encounter with Paul and uh, Barnabas uh, is recorded in Acts chapter 13. Well, in uh, the year 1877, uh, this inscription that you're looking at was found. Uh, it was found uh, on the island of uh, Cyprus uh, near one of the cities. Uh, that was an important city on that island, of which Sergius Paulus was um, uh, governor or proconsul. So, um, uh, found in 1877, this inscription, found near Paphos, it bearing Sergius Paulus' name and title as proconsul. So, X13 uh, didn't make that up. Paul didn't make that up. Um, he's a very famous person. Uh, ten years later, uh, actually, the name of Sergius Paulus was found on a memorial stone in Rome. 
the ancient capital of the empire, and the stone records that in the year 47 AD, he was appointed as one of the keepers of the banks and channels of the Tiber River in downtown Rome, a very important position in the imperial capital, and that he held this office when he returned to Rome after his three years as governor of Cyprus. So we have uh, outside non-biblical reference to this person and that his, his role, and once again we are reminded of the fact that uh, the New Testament doesn't make up stuff, take or leave it for its claims, but uh, uh, you might want to be slow in um, making assumptions that it makes up stories or parts of stories as it goes. Here is the text of Acts 13. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they, being Paul and Barnabas, went down to Seleucia. From there they sailed to the island of Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came to a certain magician. I came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he, he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Now notice verse 12, please. Then the proconsul Sergius Paulus believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. What uh, Acts 13, 12 records is that um, there was a powerful uh, um, piece of evidence, supernatural in a sense, as Paul was able to do, Saul was able to do miracles, and he blinded uh, this false prophet right there in front of the Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Here is um, uh, another inscription found testifying to the existence, the role, the importance of Sergius Paulus, this uh, proconsul mentioned in Acts 13. This was found in what we call Turkey today, in Antioch of Turkey, or Pisidian Antioch, and in the top line, it has uh, the Latin abbreviations for um, Sergius Paulus. We know all about him, him his family, uh, very famous. And here are quick pieces of miscellaneous evidence of details of New Testament stories given to us by archaeology.